Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. By now, most of us will be feeling the pinch from rising costs and housing pressures. So what's the government going to do to help us? Today, 7.30's chief political correspondent, Laura Tingle, on the most pressing issue for Anthony Albanese as Parliament returns. Laura, we chatted at the end of last year and we discussed how things were going so far for the Albanese government and it was pretty smooth. It was working to tick off its election promises. Everyone seemed pretty happy that things were going pretty well, weren't they? They were going really well. They did get through a staggering amount of legislation, uh, considering it was essentially only, you know, less than six weeks, uh, sorry, six months of parliament. Mm. Uh, The new year started a little bit more scrappy, um, obviously, with things like the voice uh, being somewhat uncertain. Mm. So, you know, they're still ambitious for this year. Nothing is more ambitious than trying to get a referendum up, but it's a a lot of challenges ahead on the economics front as well, Sam. Yeah, we discussed that last year that, in fact, financially things are going to get really tough for a lot of Australians this year and that's going to be a problem for the government, isn't it? Because I think there'll be many Australians that will want some help from the Albanese government during this time. Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, the the rental crisis continues to be really shocking by Australian standards. I mean, Mm. anecdotally, you hear extraordinary stories about people missing out even though they offer six months rent in advance on places that are, you know, still astronomically priced and mm. and so on. Uh, there's there's uh, obviously a lot of people still living under the poverty line and being forced even further backwards by high inflation. Uh, the government's scope for doing something about that would appear constrained, but we have seen this report from the International Monetary Fund talking about you know, what the government you know, can or should do or what it's facing. And one of the interesting things is it's been talking about uh, going back to the question of the taxation of housing and capital gains on uh, on houses, you know, as a way of trying to address the housing affordability issue that is reducing the um, attractiveness of housing as, as an investment. Mm. Uh, doesn't seem to be talking about getting rid of negative gearing, but certainly um, changing that regime. And I think you know, there will be uh, immense pressure on the government to address those sorts of issues this year. The International Monetary Fund has called on Treasurer Jim Chalmers to wind back capital gains tax breaks for homeowners and broaden the GST to increase economic growth. In its annual review of Australia, the IMF believes the local economy... Mm, It's also the IMF suggested they broaden the GST. That seems like a a big idea. That is a big idea, but uh, (laughs) the bottom line is, uh, you know, we don't have enough money to pay for the services we want. The pandemic has shown us that we need more services, that we need, you know, a bigger and better health system uh, in the future. And I think the uh, discussion is going to have to go back to the tax base and that obviously includes um, expanding the, the range of goods on which goods and services tax are paid. Mm. Well, I want to step back with you, Laura, because we haven't seen inflation this high and interest rates rise so quickly since the 1990s, since Paul Keating's recession we had to have. This is a recession that Australia had to have. That the spending... What was the public mood towards the government back then? What was it like? Uh, well, it was very different. Um, mm. Apart from anything else, of course, uh, interest rates were still seen as being set by the government, even though it had gradually sort of tried to step away from that. Um, But the government was still seen in those days as very much with its hands on the levers, as the expression went, of running wages policy, even if it was via an accord with the ACTU, of uh, sort of setting interest rates, and of course, um, the sort of idea that by its budgetary measures, it could really have a really powerful impact on the economy. The cost of living has jumped, with annual inflation now running at just under 9%. Opposition leader John Howard says the government has lost control of the economy. Well, it's a rotten figure and everybody around Australia knows it because prices are going up every week in the shops and supermarkets all around Australia. Now, that equation has all changed. 
So the political fallout is not as direct. Everybody uh, loves to hate on Phil Lowe now, the Reserve Bank Governor, mm. because he's making independent monetary policy decisions. Uh, but the, the, that doesn't mean that the government isn't left with a sort of mop-up from such a savage interest rate increase as we have seen, you know, the sorts of pressures we've seen on the economy uh, from those interest rate rises. We've got, I think, a third of people coming off, third of mortgage holders coming off fixed rate uh, loans this year. So, you know, you, you've got a lot of people who haven't yet felt the impact of those housing interest rate rises yet. Mm. Um, that's going to once again maximise the pressure on the government to do something about it. But my sense is we're, we're sort of reaching, sort of getting close to the peak of interest rates in the next couple of months. And once that has passed, the discussion will be very much about the fallout from from that uh, once-off adjustment in rates as opposed to uh, whether whether it's working or not. What can, Laura, the Albanese government do to ease pressure to help Australians just through this period when interest rates are so high and people are struggling to repay those mortgages? Well, their classic answers on this, of course, have been things like um, doing something about energy prices. Mm. Now, that's that they have done stuff on that, but it's still sort of basically in play. This bill has now been agreed to. The government's rushed pre-Christmas bill, legislating a $12 a gigajoule cap on gas, a mandatory code of conduct for suppliers and a $1.5 billion compensation package for low- and middle-income households and small businesses. They're arguing that what has happened to date already has uh, taken pressure off further rises in energy prices. Price caps are having an impact already. Uh, when you look at the, the caps that are there in the futures market, uh, the prices have come down substantially. They came but down I don't know people, it's one of those invisible things that people don't necessarily give them credit for. I think there will be immense pressure on um, the government to sort of continue to give some sort of income support, particularly to low-income earners, and surprisingly the IMF was actually advocating that as well. And keep in mind that when these international bodies like the IMF and OECD come here and provide their reports, a lot of it is basically not quite signed off by the government, but, you know, it's basically done with, with the government's um, knowledge and, uh, mm. and forbearance. So it does give you a bit of a view about where the debate may be heading in terms of what the government is prepared to discuss. So I think short term there'll be some, some of these income support measures um, and I suspect other than that there'll be attempts to try to sort of ameliorate the sort of shock impact on those households coming off fixed rates. Uh, in some way, shape or form, even if it's just by strong-arming the banks to sort of adjust people gently to that interest rate increase. Mm, they did promise wages growth. Is that going to happen, Laura? That's what we need, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, um, and I, I, you sort of get a sort of a slightly nervous laugh from ministers now about this. Mm. Uh, Tony Burke, who's the Workplace Relations Minister, was asked at the press club whether uh, the government was still promising Australians that wages would be higher in real terms by the end of this term. Um, and he went off into a, quite a long discussion about Cabinet and uh, the Fair Work Commission and real things. <laughs> mm. workers, or will you have to explain to workers that even though, despite those promises at the last election, you won't be able to get real wages higher? Every worker knows that we are fighting to improve their wages. Uh, we did that from the moment we were in with the submission to the annual wage review. Uh, now, we made our commitments to that before we were in government, where obviously... We um, which basically suggested uh, to me that um, it's partly out, there, out of their hands because it depends um, on how the Fair Work Commission uh, continues to consider wage cases. But, you know, at some point they're going to have to bite the bullet, I think, and say, look, you know, we thought we could deliver uh, real wage gains. We're doing everything in our power to improve the bargaining position of wage earners, but it's not going to happen because inflation is just mm. much higher than we ever expected. Yeah. Okay. So there was also a promise during the election campaign by Anthony Albanese, and he said it a number of times, a lot of times, in fact, that they would shave off $275 from household power bills by 2025. I gather they can't do that electricity anymore. Electricity prices fall from the current level by $275 for households by 2025. I don't think anybody's really expecting them to do that anymore. But as, as I said, they're really looking at sort of saying, well, look, 
energy prices haven't gone up as much as they would otherwise have gone as a result of the various steps we've taken. But um, yes, I think that's, that promise has sort of gone the way of the uh, cassowary, no, not the cassowary, um, the dodo. <laughs> <laughs> the dodo, yes. All right. So uh, let me ask you, Laura, while they're dealing obviously with these cost of living pressures, and that will be front of mind for so many Australians, the government also has a huge agenda ahead of it this year. You mentioned The Voice, and we've spoken quite a lot on the podcast about that, but they've also got a lot of other policies to navigate their way through. So it's going to be a big year, isn't it, for the Albanese government? It is. And, you know, they, they do, they've, they've, they haven't, they uh, have you know, had that terrible thing of getting into government and suddenly becoming jaded. They're all still very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed mm. and enthusiastic about actually doing things that, you know, transform the country and, um, uh, and you know, set, in, set, set an agenda in place for being in government for a long time. Um, and uh, so there's a bit of uh, hastening slowly on some things, but um, there's still a lot of uh, IR measures that they want to uh, address. Um, the voice, um, there's a huge agenda in uh, the health space with reforming Medicare and of course in skills and education. So I think it's, it's still going to be a very big year. Mm, And they hope to be in power for a long time. But, Laura, the electoral cycles are so short, aren't they? And every moment matters, and it matters a lot. Every moment matters. And it's interesting that the PM's basically been out and visible since, you know, since New Year's Day, um, partly because he he got sick with COVID and everything was a bit delayed. But, uh, yeah, uh, it it is every moment matters. But I think one of the things that I sort of feel about it is that while we're sort of we've sort of moved into uh, perpetual campaigning for the whole time since John Howard was prime minister, it doesn't feel quite so much like everything under the the current government is directed at the next election. You know, there, there is a sort of sense of we're trying to do good policy here. So um, you know, while while they've always obviously got an eye on the electoral cycle, I think they're trying to do some good stuff, and I think the sort of disruption on the coalition side of politics uh, caused by their internal problems and also by um, the disruption of the gr- of the teals um, means that there's not that sort of existential anxiety in this government about what's going to happen at the next election as, as there has been in the past. Mm, so less politics and more policy. We hope so. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Laura. OK, thanks, Sam. Laura Tingle is 7.30's chief political correspondent. The Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has hinted that there will be additional cost of living relief in the May budget. It's likely to be targeted at low income earners and pensioners. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Sydney Peed and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. I'm Sam Hawley. You can find all our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.